Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Lisa Moon, President and CEO of the Global Food Banking Network. Thank you so much for joining us today for this session on food banks, the UN Food System Summit, and the future of food. We are thrilled to be hosting this special conversation between Dr. Agnes Kalibata and Catherine Bertini. A few housekeeping items. Please make sure you select your language preference using the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and select English or Spanish. After we hear from our speakers, we should have time for questions from the audience. So please submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and is on the record. A video recording will be available following the session. As we all know, this is an extremely important moment for food systems conversations. Not only are we looking forward to the first ever UN Food Systems Summit, but we are hosting this conversation in the midst of the COVID pandemic. The Global Food Banking Network has been honored to serve food banks in over 40 countries as they have been on the front lines of providing humanitarian relief over the past year. In fact, in 2020, more than two and a half times the number of people turned to a community food bank for a meal than, than in 2019. So today we have two phenomenal women who are working to make the food system more resilient, equitable, and productive for all. Dr. Agnes Kalibata serves as the UN's Special Envoy to the Food System Summit, where she is providing leadership, guidance, and strategic direction. She has also served also serves as a president for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa since 2014. Catherine Bertini is Distinguished Fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She was named the 2003 World Food Prize Laureate for her transformational leadership at the World Food Program, which she led for 10 years. She is a champion of the 2021 United Nations Food Systems Summit, and she also serves on the Global Food Banking Network's Board of Directors. Thank you for joining today, and I'm gonna turn the conversation over to Catherine. Hello, thank you very much, Lisa Moon, and thank you to the Global Food Banking Network and to all the people listening who are working so hard to recover food and buy food and be able to reach so many people in need with food assistance. Of course, today food recovery is high on the list and with that in mind, we are really happy to welcome Dr. Agnes Kalabata. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from Nairobi for this important discussion today. Um, Agnes, you, you went from uh, being a young girl with an education opportunity to uh, a community leader and then a country leader and an African uh, leader and, and now a world leader in discussing food and food systems. Mm -hmm. And it would be really helpful for us if you could just give us a few thoughts about what inspired you as a young girl to go into science, to go into agriculture and, and ultimately to be a leader. Thank you, Catherine, and let me just start by thanking you all. Thank you, Lisa, and you all at uh, the Global Food Network uh, for organizing this uh, uh, forum that allows us to have a conversation around what's happening in our world today from a food systems perspective. Uh, but, but Catherine, to go to your exact question, um, I mean, um, my starting circumstances is exactly circumstances. It's not something <laughs> that one plans to find themselves in. Uh, growing up as a young girl in a refugee camp in, 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 in the rural area, whereby some of the, the things that people take for granted really become uh, very profound for you. You start asking questions around, um, you know, why don't we have classrooms? Why don't we... Um, uh, I, I mean, in, fa in fact, let me, let me put it differently. Some of the things that people take for granted are things that when you grow up, you actually thought that that's what life is about, right? You, you, di you did don't realize that not having a decent classroom was a challenge back then. Not being able to have, um, for diff the all families and different families having different levels, different, having acceptable levels of food was, was a major challenge. So, so really, after, afterwards, when you get exposed to the right levels of, of, um, of what society should look like, then you realize that your society, your community missed out on a lot. But then you also realize that there are opportunities within us and among us that we, we can take advantage of and just make a difference in people's lives. So for me, it's a combination of knowing that these things are not always there in, in community. 
communities, especially rural communities, and knowing that they exist on the other hand as technologies, as improved seeds, as good fertilizers that can make changes in people's lives. And, and just being able to help people have access to these things and ensure that they produce more and ensure that their children go to school like I did. You know, my, my dad had a sense of uh, how he could send us to school because he was a teacher. He had been a teacher before he became a refugee. So worked very hard to send us to school. So it, all this stuff gave me an opportunity to understand um, how to care for communities that don't have necessarily the right levels of exposure, but also don't have the means that many of us take for granted. And then of course, having grown up in the science world, which, which I ended up going into, just recognizing the power that sits in you know, some of the technologies that the world already has to transform people's lives. You know, this guy is the basis of my passion. The fact that you can use some of those things to completely transform people's lives is a huge opportunity that we are not taking enough advantage of, but really something I'm prepared to continue doing until I feel like everybody that needs a good seed, that needs to have good yields has, has got that capability. Well, well, what a perfect background to be now in charge of the summit. So uh, the summit where uh, it's everyone's hope that uh, there'll be new systems, new approaches, transformative ideas that can really be used throughout the world. So it's perfect, perfect connection. Um, uh, this, this UN, we're jumping over AGRA and maybe we can come back to AGRA because I think that's very exciting too. But, but on the topic of the food system summit, um, the UN, can you give us just a little background about it? Why did uh, Antonio Gutierrez think this was important to do now? And, um, and it seems that COVID, of course, has come into our, intruded into all of our lives, even after this decision was made about the food summit. Um, but what do, what do you think the UN hopes to achieve? What do you hope to achieve at the summit? Yeah. So one of the, the reasons that uh, the Secretary General thought it was important to launch the Food System Summit was one, one that we are behind on a number of things, right? We, we said we would come through on SDGs as a way of coming through for humanity. Um, we are behind on hunger. We are behind on nutrition indicators. In fact, hunger has been increasing even before COVID. And, and we are behind on uh, there are a number of other things like the like obesity and so many other things that are happening within our, the midst of our food system that basically is not representative of where our food system should be going. But this is also happening at a time when climate change has just picked so much momentum, much more than we had expected in terms of how it is impacting people's lives every day in terms of how shocks uh, uh, in everyday people's lives, especially in the farming system is so huge. And, and that recognition, but also recognizing the food system itself is contributing further to the climate, climate um, change challenge, contributing to biodiversity loss at higher levels than, than we, had, we had ever thought uh, we should be doing. It, it's all the combination of all these things, realizing that the food system is at the center of so many of the SDGs, in, in fact, nearly all 17, and then recognizing that the food system is really part of what uh, some of the challenges that we have. And unless we fix some of these challenges, we'll probably go into a situation where it, it starts getting becoming very difficult to come through on some of the things we are start, starting trying to come through on. So for example, hunger. How do you come through on hunger <clears throat> today, this irrespective of whatever investments you make? If that is going to be eroded and taken away by climate change. So, so some of these are really be creating a spiral that, that would become extremely challenging in the future. And I guess he really saw an opportunity to say the time is now for us to start thinking about how we come through, right? It's not just coming through, it's also about how we need to come through on the SDGs, but we need to come through understanding fully well the impact we are having on our environment and how much our environment can handle, can't handle. Right, right. And, and fitting into that it, it is our host, the Global Food Banking Network, because of course food banking is uh, a, a way to help feed a lot of people who are all of a sudden in need especially, but also to be able to recover food and not have it go to the landfill and be able to, uh, be able to actually have a, a system, a community-based system for, for food recovery. So uh, I'm, I know the food banking people 
listening and, and, and watching are hopeful that there's, uh, there will be places to input those kind of ideas into the food system summit. So first of all, let me say that the work you all are doing from a food banking perspective is, is huge for where we are at today for, for two major reasons. Food waste is one of our biggest problems. So let me just give you an example. If you took uh, how much waste is happening in, in Europe today, it's equivalent to exactly in dollar terms, the amount of food that Sub-Saharan Africa is producing today, basically enough to feed a continent. So, but instead of feeding a continent, it's contributing to waste, which waste is contributing 8% to climate change. We don't need that. More importantly, with COVID now and with all the challenges that we've seen with COVID, so many people have fallen out of jobs. So many people need support. So many people need, you know, to, to make it to tomorrow. The, the food at the table has decreased, but also the ability to make it through tomorrow is, is just challenged. And it's not just in one place, it's around the world, especially as a result of COVID-19. So being able to stand up for these communities and be there for them reminds me of what Mother Teresa said one day, that feed, if you can't feed 100 people, at least feed one, you know? And you're not feeding one, you're feeding millions of people. And it's really just so important because this is a basic human right that we are, you guys are coming through on and, and we really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I wanna circle back to that thought about what food, food banking leaders can do in, in an, after a couple more questions. But one of them is about the summit uh, itself and the, the system, I guess, Agnes, that you and your colleagues created in order to put the summit together because um, uh, it's the first time I've seen in the UN context anyway, that you've on purpose looked for diversity at all the levels of your leadership of the, all the volunteers working on this project. For instance, uh, the vice chairs of the, your, your topic related committees are, are young people uh, and from the South and from the North. I, I was gonna meet with one of your chairs on another topic one time and he said, I have to change the meeting because I have a meeting of the food systems summit and I can't defer it to my vice chair because she has a high school class today. And it's, wow, is this wonderful? I mean, it's, it's uh, so it, it just one example, I think of the diversity that you're bringing to the table. Uh, but, so I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about how you extend that diversity in terms of the people involved in the summit and, and then ultimately, um, ultimately in, the, uh, in the solutions. And then I've got a follow-up question about that also. Yeah, so I, I also remember that earlier on you, you asked the question around what does success mean? So for mm. me, part of what success means for this summit is being able to reach as many people as possible. Recognizing that each of us has an opportunity, each of us is impacting our food system. First of all, we are taking out from the food system and we are putting something in the food system, good or bad. So we, we have the ability to impact our food system. So reaching out to everyone is important, number one. Number two, there's so much diversity and food systems are local. So if we don't take it to people in their local environments, in indigenous people's environments, who are the biggest stewards of our environment, in the producers who are struggling to keep these food systems going despite climate change and others, in the fishers, if we don't take it to them and help them understand that they are not struggling alone, but also that they are part of ensuring that we don't continue uh, eroding uh, the only resource we have when it comes to, to our planet. But then the real, real issue here is this, the, the erosion of our planet is about eroding our future and our future belongs to our children. That's why the vice chairs of, of these committees are young people who are not part of what has been happening, but who need to be part of defining what the future looks like. So that's why we are giving them such a seat at the table so that they can be part of raising their voices. I mean, if today, even an eight year old kid understands and prays about climate change going away, play, prays about COVID going away. I can't tell you how many times I hear that every day. You know, please go, go and take COVID away. And yet this is something that is coming from, from my environment. So it's really building that level of consci consciousness around among people, but also empowering people to know that the future belongs to them and that having a voice in that future is extremely important. Good, thank you very much. But one thing I learned when I was at World Food Program and then later involved in different UN issues is that some people approach um, conferences or, or, or 
broader issues within the UN context on a practical basis. You know, how are we going to get more Africans to have their own ability to feed themselves, for instance? And some people uh, look at it more on an ideological perspective. We have this ideology, this is what we want to produce, uh, this is what we want to promote, um, this is what we want that the system should be. And the ideology may be wonderful in a, in a perfect world, but it doesn't necessarily work in, the, in a practical world. Um, that's, I think, one of the dichotomies that you have in terms of trying to put together ultimately a plan that's that's acceptable. I mean, you could you could split that down into also north north issues of the north and issues of the south, or um, issues of uh, uh, countries with enough rainfall and without enough rainfall. Or I mean, there's there's so many different kind of splits, and then and then there's a suspicion because because people often think well of any government or of the UN or well they're not going to they're not going to include my issue um, or they're going to have too many of that other guy's stuff and not enough about mine so how, how do you how do you juggle all of this in terms of trying to come up with ultimately a, a paper that will get broad support so that is a very very important question uh, because one of the i mean being in the space that I'm in, I'm always asking myself, how is that relevant to my continent? How is relevant, that relevant to my community? So part of how we designed the Food System Summit is a whole lot of dialogues that are happening. We have member state dialogues that recognize that South America is different from Africa, that recognize that Europe is different from Africa, and, and, and even within Africa that country X is different from country Y. Even within that country, that community X is impacted differently than community Y. So recognizing those complexities of the food system is part of being able to find the right level of solutions to the problem. Now, in terms of, the, of communities and, and different people and where they are at, we've also organized what we are calling independent dialogues. So we have lots of indigenous people's dialogues that are going on to help us understand what they care about, but also what they are able to do and what they can't do, what they would like to see done. Same thing with uh, producers, same thing as fishers. So all these dialogues are going on to empower people to have a voice around the things that matter to them, not what we are saying from, I don't know, UN or from the center, whatever that center is, to help people say what they are seeing based on where, where they are at. Now, the way we are bringing it all together is uh, we, we, we have, we, we, I, and one other thing I should add, we also have an expert group of scientists that is looking at all these things and trying to cross check and trying to make sure that whatever we are, we are saying and doing is grounded in, 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 in the realities of science and evidence of science. So that's a very important backup, uh, irrespective of, of whatever we come up with, it's a very important backup. So what we're trying to do, so like recently we had, a retreat just to bring all these groups together. And there's no one group that is right. Your action tracks, your scientific group, your whatever. What we really cared about was, if we were to listen, let, let's listen to the whole world. What's the one, two, three in that order things that people care about the most that will help us shift, that people say that if we did this, would actually shift things. So it's not based on the fact that action tracks as people that have, have expertise working in these areas have brought out these ideas by themselves. No, it's not that they just came from dialogues alone. No, it's not that they just came from scientists alone. It's the agreement that based on the voices we are hearing, based on the conversations that are coming from all these different types of people, there are three things or four things that must shape our world where we are going. And, and that's how we really believe that we can get consensus. Now, there's a whole lot of solutions that have been suggested that are going to be context specific, that are going to be region specific. Those will also be available. And, and we really want to make them available and make sure that people can use this based on where they are at, based on the circumstances they are facing, to be able to, to get solutions, to have a sense of who they can approach and, and get ideas, to be able to have a sense also of where they can get help from based on those solutions. But in terms of defining how we move forward together, all these voices have a voice and a say in how we move forward together. Thank you. Um, what do you hope when it's over with? Uh, you, you, have a, you have a meeting in July and then a, a, a meeting, the ultimate meeting in September. Um, 
after September, what, regardless of what the, t the topics are or the issues are, what do you hope will happen next? Um, uh, past September, what, what I expect to happen is that um, we will have clearly defined goals that if we implemented in the next 10 years, will put us back on track. Those goals to be able to be implemented will need the right level of policy frameworks at country level, if we are going to hit as and reach as many people as we can. So go governments have a responsibility to think through whether there's an environment that allows what, what is coming out to be implemented at country level to get us back on track. We have to think about the type of investments that are needed to be able to do this, whether they're coming from governments themselves, whether they're coming from private sector, whether they're coming from all of us, those things have to be thought through. And then there are also things we have to think through around what we, we didn't know that we need to stop doing, but we actually now know we need to stop doing to assure that our world goes, continues going the, the right place. So for me, it's having those things in place and then having follow-up mechanisms, whether they are best uh, in, in institutions that have been doing this um, because there are a number of institutions that, that exist already that, that work on, on the food system. Uh, and, and how they get strengthened uh, to be able to follow up. The follow up between now and, 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 and 2030 could be best in those institutions or could be best in specific groups that decide that we are going to track what we said we will do and, and we'll be reporting back uh, to, to those institutions that are tracking. So yeah. for me, success is really, all, <laughs> is really ensuring that we have those, those, those commitments ensuring we have the right follow-up mechanism, but also ensuring that we as individuals understand our place in the food system. Okay, good, thanks. And, and specifically, uh, we as individuals are circling back now to the food banking um, uh, networks and, and the individual food banks in countries around the world. Uh, if you have advice about how um, the organizations or individuals can be involved now or what they should be thinking and, and or what they should be thinking about post-September in terms of involvement uh, uh, in, to promote the ideas of food recovery and also to promote the ideas of, of innovative community-based ways of feeding people. That would be great if you had any thoughts. I, I think for me, the most important thing right now is to continue to link into the, the food system because there's so much information that is coming out in terms of solutions and those solutions are put in buckets of reducing food waste, you know, advancing um, social protection, advancing, uh, you know, where, where I imagine uh, advancing things like school feeding, advancing communities, uh, I mean, feeding communities, especially uh, food banks, like you're saying. So there are a number of solutions and going to the food system summit, there are going to be groups and people and communities that are looking to to get together on issues that they care about and countries that, that, that want to get together on issues they, they care about. So how, how we design coming through on those issues is going to be around how we align our, our working together, how we align the things we care about to, to SDGs and to coming through on some of these, these challenges. So food banks have a central role. You've defined it yourself, a central role in ensuring that we really uh, reduce food waste, continue reducing food waste, number one, number two, and probably primarily that we use that food to feed people that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that need it. Number three, it could actually be part of just feeding the world because that food can be recycled, processed into things that, um, that be become part of feeding the world. So it's, it's really an honorable job that you all are doing. Thank you, and on, on everyone's behalf, thank you very much uh, for that vote of confidence in the work of food banking people around the world. Um, Agnes, just a couple of days ago, I saw you interview the new uh, laureate, World Food Prize laureate, and one of the uh, things you and she talked about was, we're being women in the science profession and, uh, and women in, in agriculture. And so I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that 70% of the food banks uh, in our network are run by women. Uh, and um, uh, we have all of us, I think, uh, around the world, an important responsibility to be sure that uh, we've gone out of our way using school feeding, it, it, you mentioned school feeding, 
or other um, other programs to be sure that girls have a chance to be educated because there's so much that they have and can offer um, in the food system, not just running food banks and being scientists, but even keeping their families together and ensuring that everyone has a chance to, to have good nutrition. I mean, if you think about those families for whom you're reducing the burden of thinking about food so that kids can feed and be able to, to do their homeworks right, it's huge. The contribution there is huge. So I really think that there's an opportunity there to, co to continue ensuring that, it's, you know, maybe what I should also mention this, the, the famine, the report that just came out on conflict and famine. I mean, it just puts so much pressure on, on, on food banks and, and the ability of you all to, to reach out to, and, and keep some of those communities going while waiting for their lives to return to normalcy. So there's a huge responsibility there. And again, I, I wish you well and we'll continue to work together on this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Um, well, that is, I think, part of the good news of this summit. Uh, different perhaps than some others is that your outreach has really been remarkable to try to to try to bring in um, as many people as possible. Well, actually, you're not actually necessarily bringing people in. You're get, you're offering the platform to, for people to come in, and uh, and that's uh, part of the reason why you're here. Thank you for joining us, but also why the whole system has been doing so much outreach, which is um, hopefully a new model for uh, for UN summits in the in the future. Um, I think it's almost time to go to, to questions from the audience, but do you have anything else you'd like to add uh, before we do? No, I, I mean, I just want to thank you. Thank you for what you're doing and um, encourage you to, uh, the, the, the team behind all this work, the, 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 the group, the leadership behind, behind all this work, the food, food banks, really to double down and, and help people overcome what COVID has put us in, overcome people help people overcome some of the challenges that are shared with famine that we are seeing now as you know recently I was just looking prices are continuing food prices are continuing to improve and that makes it impossible for some of these families to access food so what you're doing to ensure that even as COVID continues moving from one village to another one country to another that families that are falling out of their ability to have food can access food is extremely important and I just wanted to encourage you to help us survive this as we try to rebuild our, our, our food system, as we try to rebuild our country. So thank you so much for having me. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the first questions is about funding and how, um, how do we convince funders to support things they haven't funded before, one being how, tackling food waste. The, the questioner says, um, uh, how can we use the summit for people to wake up to the importance and the value of improving the system through, through, um, for instance, um, uh, dealing with food waste? Uh, they point out that a few years ago this happened with plastics. That that, that there was a new interest in in um, dealing with the, the issue of plastics, polluting the environment. But um, how do we get there? And I and I'll add to that that I remember reading not too long ago that. Most of the agriculture research in the world goes into production of agriculture, but not necessarily post agriculture, post production, um, and that includes uh, that includes uh, food waste. So, so any any ideas about that? First of all, let me say that um, of the things I've seen um, significant appetite uh, for in, as one of the solutions in the food system. Uh, reducing food waste is something that people I, seem to be interested in, uh, especially private sector. So, so I, I'm, 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 I'm sure it's one area that will continue to be important, and I'm sure it's 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 an area that uh, that uh, a lot of that indicators are going to be built for that can help people come through uh, in in terms of um, reducing food waste. In terms of overall mobilizing uh, people to be able to engage around some of the things in the food system summit that seem like they are new, I guess the issue has to be about the, the cost of doing nothing. The cost of, and because the cost is no longer just that doing nothing is okay, the cost is the, the, the impact of not being able to do the right thing. And, and the true cost of food systems and, and true cost of food, these things are beginning to come out. And I think once people look at numbers, that are coming out, um, 
we, we will then start to understand the, the responsibilities that we have around trying to make sure that we do something. So, so I think it's also being able to have visibility of what action looks like and what that action will buy us. So, so I'm not worried that people will, 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 will see the opportunity to do something around uh, the, the fact that not doing nothing is an option. Hmm. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, still on the food waste uh, uh, issue, um, you mentioned a lot of different players hopefully will be involved post, post September, post report, uh, including governments, of course. And um, some governments will be, uh, will be um, kind of laissez-faire about this and say this is nice and people can do whatever they want. And other governments obviously will be uh, more prescriptive and perhaps consider new laws. Um, and, uh, and of course, as you mentioned, governments are all different and countries are all different. So, um, uh, I, but there are two questions relating to government roles. One is how food banking um, uh, partners can be involved with government in order to create national plans post September. And the other was uh, whether or not governments should be more proactive about food waste and about mandates about food waste. So I think there's a there's an opportunity to be more proactive around food waste, um, recognizing the different categories of food waste. There are some that are preventable, um, and there are some that are very difficult to prevent, um, and that that are time bound. So, if, for example, if you're looking at fruits and vegetables, you know these are perishables. All these um, it's it's I, I guess it's two ways. There's also um, a consumer perspective that needs to come in here. The kind of standards that we set around food and whether that is actually acceptable anymore, right? A lot of food that you take in food banks is food that is perfectly okay to eat. We're not talking about food, food in food banks as food that is not fit for human consumption. It's perfectly okay to eat. It's just not being used at the right time. Right. So there's reducing that expectation on we need to do that. We need to do that because it costs so much water. It costs so much in terms of all the things we are doing to produce this type of food. And then we put so much demand on it and a lot of it has to stay where, where it is produced. So there's an opportunity for governments to work together to create frameworks alongside consumers and retailers to build a new system that reduces the amount of food in our environment. So I just think that that's something we can do. I mean, imagine uh, even a size of a fruit can lead to that fruit being rejected. Not a blemish size can lead to that fruit being rejected. Is that, the, is that right? You know, and how do we manage that? So, but besides that, I mean, we can also recycle food for the benefit of our environment, right? We can also do a regenerative agriculture is really all about ensuring that, that the nutrients we extract, we get to put back as well. So, so there are ways we can start working with governments to put in place policies and, and policy frameworks that encourage um, more, more, you know, more return, more recycling of, of nutrients, but also reduce nutrient waste by reducing uh, the pressure we are putting on our food system. Yeah. Um, good, good point. And and uh, I don't think really a question, but a comment from someone who said when we when we think about food recovery, we have to pay also attention. When we think about food recovery, we have to also pay attention to food safety. Of course, we do. I'll, I'll tell you, say a little. Uh, uh, story from my WFP times, uh, one government was pushing us very, very hard to take um, frozen beef to send to North Korea. And um, we said, well, this is a bad idea for a bunch of reasons, one of which was there wasn't enough refrigeration to take care of frozen beef in North Korea. But the second was that we had our own rules that said we would only accept food that was acceptable in the country of origin. So, you know, if it's okay for you to eat in your country, then it's then okay, then we, it's, it's okay for somebody else to eat, but don't please give us your food. In this case, mad cow, uh, 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 slaughtered cows to give to another country. So um, I think there's a there's a important issue on food safety, although that's a big broader, bit broader perhaps than the questioner. Yeah. Agnes, I said at the beginning, I wanted to come back to Agra. And fortunately we have a question about Agra. So, um, so uh, it, uh, very specifically it says, tell us about Agra, your day job. Uh, but before before uh, I asked you that, um, 
Um, I know that Bagra uh, has a very distinguished uh, beginning, uh, having been first chaired and, and organized by Kofi Annan, and, um, and then the first uh, uh, CEO there was Namanga Ngongi. Um, you follow in, in um, um, big footsteps of which you are, you are uh, uh, just as big uh, in terms of uh, your leadership and what you're doing with AGRA, but maybe just a, a few uh, minutes for the audience to know what AGRA is in all of this. Well, some of the wonderful uh, initiatives and successes that you've had at AGRA. No, thank you for asking that. Um, and I know you were there at the beginning, so I'm really grateful that uh, the RBAs were part of supporting uh, Kofi Annan, help neutralize, you know, crystallize the vision of an institution like Agro on the African continent. So Agro was founded to fill basically to fill a gap on the African continent. And the gap was more around the, the ability for African farmers to access technologies and the ability for African institutions to create um, systems and ecosystem that delivers those technologies to farmers. And when I'm talking about technologies here, I'm talking about simple things like improved seed, right? Having access to the right variety of seed in the right environment that allows you to double your yields. You know, in, in places in Africa where yields are doubling, excesses are happening. So simple things as doubling yields become extremely critical in those landscapes. We are not talking about five times as much, we are not talking about six times as much as you, or 10 times as much as you see in the US, but just the ability to double your yields so that you have enough food to eat and you have enough uh, to sell to the market and be able to send your kid to school. So even simple things like that were absent in many places in Africa. So Kofi Annan and uh, partners he reached out to, it was really to just ensure that Agra can help build an ecosystem that allows what's happening in the CGIR, a great organization that is producing some of the best um, materials to improve yields to ensure that that translates in Africa and happen and actually gets into farmers' hands. So what AGRA does really is just to support national systems to ensure that national researchers can get a variety of cowpea um, that yields twice as much as now yields in Burkina Faso and help Burkina Faso to create a system that allows a farmer to access that variety. The journey from the CDIR to the farmer is so long and so difficult. Even I, as a minister of agriculture in Rwanda, left before I built the right seed system for the country. But luckily at Agra, I've been able to do it. Because when I came to Agra, I came to understand what I was doing wrong in Rwanda. So Agra has a number of scientists that are helping this country to put these systems in place to ensure that farmers can access the right materials to improve their yields. So the other thing then we are doing is to support governments with all these capacity gaps and recognizing that institutions and capacity and skills is what you need to build an ecosystem that can deliver for farmers. We, we use that knowledge now to help governments from one government to another to, to see what is broken and what can we help you with so that you put that ecosystem in place so that African farmers too can improve, can access good yields, can access good information around how to manage their soils and can be able to access markets. So we really work on a day-to-day -day basis on working through those challenges so that the ecosystem can, can work for the, for the African smallholder farmer. SMEs can function. And, and governments continue re reforming policies so that, uh, so that they can deliver for the farmers. It's a job that I enjoy having come from Rwanda where we're able to, to, to do a lot of that. So I enjoy really being able to understand from one country to another what, what is, what's not happening right and how can we support them from what we are now calling transferable assets. That, that's, and that's the beauty of Agra. What you learn from one country, you can quickly take to another country without necessarily inventing the wheel. Yeah, yeah. well, and Rwanda has been a leader uh, and, uh, uh, in this in many areas. So uh, uh, it's interesting that you've even learned something from Agra because I'm sure you've taught them a lot too. Uh, uh, one of the things I loved about Agra uh, is that it's one of the, at least then when, I, when it began, one of the few organizations that was able to connect the private sector, the public sector, the, the academic institutions, the UN, the NGOs, in a, and, and put them all together in order to make it, it really good programming that could help uh, smallholder farmers in Africa. And um, I think we need more organizations that 
aren't married only to governments or only to uh, uh, donors or um, but that but that can juggle uh, really all the different components of trying to build capacity. So congratulations. No, thank you. I, I think that's how I ended up in the food system summit. I just feel like my my dead job has become juggling pieces, putting in the right people in the right country at the right time, and just asking. So what do what else do you need so that you get moving? What else do you need so that you do the, the next thing? And I enjoy it because they are the things that people don't really invest in. They are the things that people assume are happening, but actually are the things that are holding us back. Yeah, great, great. Thanks. A couple more quick questions if we, we can get them in. One of them is uh, uh, about uh, artificial barriers between countries. This comes from somebody from Ghana. Uh, artificial trade barriers between countries. How can we convince policymakers to create more space that allows for successful movement of agriculture and food products across borders, especially in Africa? So, so that's a, an interesting question and, and a very timely one. We are at a time when we have just launched the, free, the African Free Continental Trade Area, that whose success in agriculture is going to depend on what you said earlier, Catherine, on food safety, right? Ensuring that, that, that we build our capability to, to trade in safe food is going to reduce barriers further. Yes, there are barriers that are, are put in place and necessary, but I think we also need to understand the, 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 the challenge around the quality of food when it comes to trade and around how much this gets to open up so much. So I feel like our biggest responsibility, we just, uh, in Agra, we just uh, opened up a food trade uh, department that is funded by FCDO, that is being supported by FCDO. They are supporting us to, to ensure that we do this. But what we are trying to do is to understand the challenges around moving food from one country to another. And one of the biggest challenges is the quality of food, right? And the ability to, to, to have harmonized standards around quality of food so that trade can flow. The, the, the good news is a lot of countries are working on this. The, 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 the regional communities and countries themselves are putting a lot of energy in this and hopefully um, this will start happening. But I must say definitely food is one of the most difficult areas to trade in because it's easily damaged and impacts people's lives. So we need to understand that we need to overcome these, these barriers. Right, thank you very much. Um, there's, uh, there is a uh, question about gender with the, which uh, uh, we're, we're going to run out of time before either of us can adequately answer, but I, I'm going to say to the questioner that with Agnes is the chair of this conference and with many, uh, many, many women as, uh, in leadership roles uh, in her committees and as champions and elsewhere, a gender, gender will not be forgotten. I can guarantee that at this conference. Uh, uh, and it'll be more than implicit, I'm sure. Um, Agnes, any final words you'd like to add before we close? I mean, on gender, I'm a product of Rwanda, so I, I take it for granted, but I, I just recognize that I was given a huge opportunity as a woman, and, and I love uh, that, that the, the opportunity that, that that gives me, and just being able to create that opportunity when we have, we have like you said, you said something profound, that 70% of the people that are working in the food banks are women. They understand, the ones that understand for what a crying child that, that doesn't have it had food, what, what it means to have that type of child around you. You know, we are built to understand that and to know that. So um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity I've had. And um, uh, yeah, uh, to the extent that that helps, I will continue uh, taking advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and and then in terms of, of last words for the Food System Summit, thank you for putting this together, for, for making the connection between uh, well-being and the need for food, but also what COVID-19 is doing for us with the food systems. And of course, then how we can use the opportunity to reduce waste to, to, to feed people. So there's a solution here that you're not, you need to package it as one of the solutions that are coming to the Food System Summit, how to move food from one part to another and really do very, do good in the, in, in the process. So thank you for doing this. And, and really thank you for having given me the platform to engage with your community on the Food System Summit and to bring them in into the Food System Summit. Like you said, it's a platform. Welcome, engage, understand, and give ideas. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kalabata. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership and your inspiring remarks. 
uh, I know I, I say this on behalf of Lisa Moon, the, uh, the CEO of Glo uh, Global Food Banking Network, all the staff and certainly all of the network all around the world and those who are joining us who, who aren't part of that network, we appreciate it very much. And we, we applaud the approach of the summit to uh, get things back on track, uh, as you said, and to, um, or on track if some things never were, so that we can have community, um, regional and national and, and global solutions. Um, we appreciate the chance to have this discussion today and that you've been able to share your voice with us. Um, just for all, this is a been recorded as Lisa said, and it's certainly shareable. Uh, we thank you again, um, Dr. Kalavata, thank you Lisa Moon, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>